Well, happy Easter, everybody. I'm going to need a little bit of group participation right here. I'm going to say something. I'm going to have you repeat it after me. I want you to say, he is alive. Ready? He is alive. Over here, you're going to say he. You're going to say here in the middle is. And over there, you're going to say alive. Ready? What, everyone? He is alive. Now, now you sound like he might not be alive over there, right? Okay, we'll try that one more time. Ready? What? He is alive. Hey, all right. Together, one last time. Everybody, he is alive. And that is good news. Amen. Amen. That is good news. That's why we're here. If we haven't met, my name is Brent, pastor here. And I'm thankful that you've made it a priority to be here at our second service this morning. Uh, we had some early birds out this morning already at 7 o'clock. Do I have any 7 o'clock people? Put your hands in the air. You're here. I would, I would say give yourselves a hand, but it's already in the air right there. Um, and we had some breakfast burritos. I think we might have a couple of those left, but not too many. We have our 9 o'clock, and then after this, we'll have another 11 o'clock service. And we're thankful that the Lord uh, is even bringing some people online to watch with us as well. I want to say there's a lot of people that have been willing to die for what they believe. But there's only been one who has defeated death, has risen to new life, and he has a name, and his name is Jesus. Amen. And so what I want you to know is, is great things are happening around the world today, um, uh, and, and we're celebrating that. But a lot of times we wonder, but what happens next? Like, what happens next Sunday, right? Do we go back to normal? Do we continue to do what we've always done? And so what I wanted to do is I just wanted to give you a special invitation to join us again next Sunday. Now, if you come at 9 o'clock, you're going to be early, okay? Uh, because we'll go back to our one 10 o'clock service. But I'll be honest. I'm not sure how much longer we're going to be able to be at one service, but we're going to enjoy it while it lasts. So I encourage you, yeah, we're going to enjoy it while it lasts because it's fun to be a part of a church family. And if you can't tell, uh, there are some great things happening in the life of our church. But there's also great things happening in churches all over Fresno and Clovis. And we're just praying blessing over those churches as well because we're all on Team Jesus. Amen. And so what I also want you to know is, is this. I do realize that not everybody makes going to church a rhythm, a part of their life. Because we're busy. We've got lots of options. We've got a lot of distractions, a lot of things that are buying for our time. But what I wanted you to know is, is that if you don't have a church home, I would love to invite you to come back next week. As, as uh, Crystal mentioned just a little bit ago, uh, we have something next Sunday called Discover. And it's a way for you to find out a little bit about our church, where we've been, where we are, where we're going, and, to, and for you to be able to participate in that together. Find out if this is going to be a church, not only that you attend, but it's a family that you belong to. And I realize that there's some people, they belong to a church, it's called Bedside Baptist, uh, with pastor sheets, right? You know, they love that one. And some of you are doing that right now online, you know. <laughs> but, but we invite you to be a part of what's happening here and to be a part of the great things that, that are going to continue to happen. But I just want to give props where props are due. We are here today because of the sacrifice of those who've gone before us and we're standing on those shoulders and we're believing, church, that the best is yet to come. Do you believe that, everyone? I really, really do. Hey, we're in a teaching series uh, that we are wrapping up today, um, and it's called From the Upper Room to the Empty Tomb. And the empty tomb, obviously, is a tomb of, uh, it's a resurrected Christ. It's, it's going to be our text today. So if you have your Bible, I'd love to have you turn with me to the Gospel of John. If you didn't bring your Bible today, we'll be making uh, some of those things available for you up on, uh, up on the screens to follow along. But during this teaching series, we looked at the fact that Jesus had a meal he shared and we just received communion that happened um, in the upper room and then uh, and then from there went to the garden of Gethsemane where he he prayed it was a crushing experience he sweat blood if you might remember that he was put on trial he was beaten on a mountain called Golgotha that we looked at last week but then today we're going to be looking at the good news of Easter that Jesus is alive and that's good news. So with that being said, in the Gospel of John, John uh, chapter, um, gosh, we're in John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Let me read this for you. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. His name was John, by the way. And they said, I've, they've taken my Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. 
So Peter and the other disciple start, uh, started for the tomb. Both were running. The other disciple outran Peter. Sounds a little bit like brotherly love and competition there, doesn't it, right? And they reached the, uh, and, and they reached the tomb first, bent over, looked into, and saw strips of linen lying there, but they didn't go in. And then Simon Peter came along behind him because he was older, right? A little slower. And he went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloths that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. And the cloth was still lying in place separate from the linen. So something has just happened here. And finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and he believed. He saw and he believed. What everyone? He saw and he what? Believed. And they still don't understand but they still believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And friend, I want to pause there. There's some of you that you don't understand everything, but you're experiencing it, and you might have some doubts, and that's okay, but you can still believe. Scripture talks about one who said, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And so you're in a good, safe location here today if you have some questions, because God's not afraid of our questions, because he is alive, and he's still in the resurrection miracle business. Do you believe that, everyone? Verse 11, and here's where it gets good. So then, this is the focus of our message this morning. And so Mary stood outside the tomb, and she was crying. She was weeping. She bent over, looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated there where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And I don't want to, like, I don't want to, like, slow down on that. There's angels in a tomb, everybody, okay? That's a really, really big deal. It would have gotten your attention as well. They ask her, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they placed him. At this, she turned around, saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was him. He asked her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking that he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you've you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I'll go get him. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. And this is something that Jesus still does today. He still speaks our name. And he knows your name. He knew Mary's name. And at the moment she heard Jesus speak his name, her name, she turned towards him and she cried out, Rabboni, which means rabbi or teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me. I've not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I've ascended to the Father and your father, my God, and your God. And here's our last verse. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with this news. I have seen the Lord. Say that out loud with me. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he, all the things that he had said to her. Would you join me in prayer, church? Let's pray. So Lord God, we have seen the Lord. We believe that you are alive. And I also realize there are some hearing my voice right now that have doubts. They have questions. They have concerns. They have some hurts. They have some hang-ups. They have some disappointments. They have some discouragement. Some are depressed. Some are disillusioned. Just like the early believers, even the early questioners, thank you, Jesus, for meeting us where we are, for knowing our name and calling us into new life. It's in your powerful name that we pray. Amen and amen. As I love to travel to Israel, it's literally my favorite place in the world to be, except for Fresno, California. And uh, um, I've been a handful of times, and I was just about a month and a half ago given an opportunity to travel to Israel next month. Um, And that's, if you are familiar with the events that have happened in October, um, there's still not a ceasefire there, which is why we continue to pray for the peace of Israel. Amen. We're praying for that. With that being said, I was given an opportunity to travel with other pastors who take teams of people to Israel. And we will do that, but there's still, there's still a conflict. There's still, there's still a war. There's not a ceasefire. And so, unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to go. I was looking forward to it, but we're not going to go this time. With that being said, when you go to Israel, there are these places where you can go. And, and you can see with your own eyes where these events happened. Unfortunately, the empty tomb is one of those locations where there's some questions. It's like, was it here? Was it there? Where was it? But what we do know is that there was definitely an empty tomb. I've got a picture of what is commonly referred to today as the garden tomb. Look right there. And that's right outside the walls. And that wall right there would have been the wall to the old city of Jerusalem. And on the other side of that would have been 
literally a tomb which would have been found, which would have been carbon dated to the time of Christ. It's possible that Jesus would have been buried in a tomb similar to this. And, and so when it talks about the fact that they went in a garden and they went into a tomb and they looked down and peered down, it might have been something like this. You know, one of the things that I hear about people that go to Israel is it's like one of those bucket list places that people want to go to. I was reminded of a friend who he and his wife took um, their, uh, his, his mother-in-law to Israel and she always wanted to go. And when she went, it's truth truth be told is that the father, the, the son and the mother-in-law, they didn't much care for each other. But when they were there, they're hoping that this trip to the Holy Lands would have patched it up. While they were there, sadly, she passed away. The sad part about that is if you didn't realize it's very expensive to take a person from another country to the United States. They found out it was going to be very, very expensive and surprisingly inexpensive to have her buried similar to a place like this in Israel. Well, the son said, and he really wasn't a believer, he had some doubts, and he said to himself, where do we want to, how do we want to do it? Do we want to bury her in Israel or back in the States? And as a skeptic, he says, well, I heard it said one time that a person was buried here, and then after three days rose to new life, and I just can't take that chance with my mother-in-law. So we're going to go ahead, and we're going to take her home with us. Oh, by the way... That's a roller right there. You're going to get that one. I'm getting the stink eye from my wife. That might not be at 11 o'clock. Now, whether or not you love your mother-in-law or not, there's a lot of questions that people have about, did this really happen? Yeah, goodness, it was, it was okay. No, all right, all right, all right. So with that being said, um, we are focusing in on what happened on this day, what happened at this tomb. And so there are three things that I wanted to share with you. If you're having notes, if you would, write this down. Thing number one is that they experienced sorrow. It was the sorrow of Easter. Now, the, the question that was asked in the tomb at the death, at the loss, was simply this, why are you crying? Now, as a man, I'll be honest, when I see somebody crying, I get a little uncomfortable. Men, do you guys agree with me on that one? It's like, I don't know what to do. You know, you're crying, and I kind of want to ask how you're doing, but I kind of don't want you to cry more, you know? And so that happens, and we don't know what to do a lot of times when people are crying. But what we know for certain is that the reason why Mary was crying is because of her deep love for Jesus. And she was going to the tomb to check on him. And the stone was rolled away. And we see that, that uh, not only was this, the, the tomb open, but Jesus' body was missing. And it's safe to say that she was very, very sad because she was disappointed. And you know, um, there are many of us today and I know for certain, as I'm looking at the crowd right now, I know for certain that there are some of you who recently have experienced tremendous amounts of hurt and loss. Like there, there's been lost ones that have been, who have been lost too soon. There have been some really disappointing things that have happened in your life. There's some discouraging things that are happening in your life. There's some disappointments. Some of you are dealing with depression. Some of you are a little disillusioned with what's going on in life. And so for me to say that when we look at the tomb in Easter, maybe you weren't coming in here thinking that there was going to be sorrow. But the truth is, is that for there to be good news, we have to understand that there's hard news and bad news in life. Life is hard, amen? amen. But God is good. And he is a God who can take graves and he can turn them into gardens, as we sang earlier today. You know, one of the things that... Um, I love seeing about two weeks ago as we had a gathering here. We actually, every Tuesday night, we have this environment we've created. It's called 21 Pathways. And we had about 150 people show up um, at here on a Tuesday night. And they were talking about and celebrating their hurts and their habits and their hangups. And you may be thinking to yourself, why would you celebrate that? And the reason why they were wasn't because of the hurt and the habit and the hangup, but was because of the hope of Jesus. And in this room, there were tears that happened. But there are good tears and there are bad tears. There are tears of grief and loss and pain when you have no hope. But friends, there's something that happens when you have hope. It's called good news. 
And the good news that we have is, is that regardless of what we're going through, we know that God has a plan. You know, I know uh, about nine months ago when I came on staff here uh, at Bethany Church, there's a couple things that I said, and I didn't realize how true that they were going to become. But one of them was simply this, is that we're going to have a choice as a church. Are we going to become a safe place, if you will, like a, like a hotel for the holy? Or are we going to become a little bit more dangerous, like a hospital for hurting people? When I begin to think about the gospel message of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came to meet people in their hurt and where they were, in their graves, meeting them in their places that needed to be healed. And you know what we see in Mary's life is we see that she was hurting. She had had a hard life. She had, been, she had a lot of issues and challenges. And so when the scripture says that, that she was weeping, it reminds me of a passage in scripture that says this, is that weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. What I know to be true about the, our faith, friends, is this, is that God, if we'll trust him, will never waste a hurt. Whatever you're going through, whatever you've been through, whatever you're looking at down the pathway, you need to know that when God is with you, who or what, nothing could ever be against you. That is the hope of Easter. And I wish I could snap my fingers. I wish I could make it all go away. But sadly, this is true, that many times the lessons that we learn in life come at the hardest moments in our life. Do you know what I'm talking about? And sometimes we have to go through those moments, those, those tear-filled moments in the tomb when all seems lost to have our hope restored and our eyes on Christ because he is alive. Jesus is alive. Would you say that with me, church? Jesus is alive, even in the sorrow. Number two, if you would write this down. What do we see? We also see the seeking of Easter. We see that there is something about looking for truth, looking for Christ, looking for what in the world's going on right now. Verse 15, who is it or what is it that you are looking for? We know that Mary was looking for Jesus and she didn't recognize him uh, when she saw someone in the corner because she was, she was surprised, she was startled, she was a little bit just dazed and confused, you know, angels, the whole thing. But then when she heard her voice, her name in Jesus' voice, she recognized it immediately. And, and what Mary did is she actually said something kind of crazy. I was kind of looking at it this last week. She said, if you'll tell me where you've taken him, I will, I'll, I'll take it from there. And, and Jesus would have been wrapped in, in like heavy, heavy embalming. Um, he would have been like a mummy. And she would have been tiny. And he would have been a larger man and heavy at that. But she didn't care because she was seeking Jesus because what she loved had been taken from her. And then she heard her name. And one of the things that, that, that changes everything for us is when we know that, that God knows our name. He, he hears our name. And when we're looking for truth, I need you to know when you'll look to Christ, you will find it. But the question that we all have to wrestle with in point number two is this, who or what are you seeking? What are you looking for? Uh, one of my favorite uh, bands of all time, and I know there's a little bit of uh, drama on this because everyone has a favorite band, but I love you too. I'm not going to lie. And I kind of grew up and listened to the 80s and 90s, and their Joshua Tree album was pretty awesome. And they had a very, very, very famous song that they recorded the video. It's like one of the first videos I ever saw on MTV, and it was in Las Vegas. They had just got done doing a concert there, and they took to the streets of, of uh, North Vegas, would have been like Old, old Town uh, Vegas, and they filmed this video. Do you remember the name of the video? I still, what, haven't found what I'm looking for. And it's interesting to note that all of these years later, there's this now gigantic dome, ball, cube, sphere thing that they've built there. And the very first band to open that up was who, everyone? You too. And I think it's interesting that one of their most known songs of all time Ask the question, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And, and, I, and it, isn't it interesting that they would film this video in Sin City? Isn't it interesting that they would film this video where people go uh, to uh, find what they're looking for? And I know for me, there's been seasons in my life where I've gone down some paths looking for things, and I, I just honestly, I didn't find it there. 
There's some of you that have, have, have taken the, the, the ladder of life and you've climbed that ladder uh, to get to the top only to realize that that ladder was on the wrong building. Some of you have realized that there have been some paths that you've taken that have led you to places that at the time seemed right, but they were wrong. Sometimes the path of materialism is what we try to keep up with. You know, that whole adage of, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Well, the problem with trying to keep up with the Joneses is they keep on refinancing, right? And, and, then, and then the interest rates go up, and then it's a big mess. And so I know for a lot of us, when we put our hope in our health, or we put our hope in our business, we put our hope in our career, we put our hope in another person, those people will ultimately let us down. But there's one who never will, and he has a name, and his name is Jesus. Solomon, thousands of years before Christ, one of the wisest people to ever live, says these words in Proverbs 14, verse 12. He says that there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. You know, I think it's possible to fast forward out of Las Vegas and now go back 2,000 years ago when Jesus was spending time with some of his closest friends. There was a woman by the name of Mary, another gal named Mary, and she had a sister named Martha, and Jesus came over to their house for a meal. And Martha was one of the, 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 the sisters that was the responsible one, if you will, and she was making sure the food was ready. She's making sure everything was perfect for Jesus. And then her sister Mary, though, wasn't helping out. You might recall the story. Mary found herself sitting there at the feet of Jesus. And it really frustrated Martha, right? Frustrated because she wasn't, she wasn't working. And notice what Jesus says to Martha in Luke chapter 10, verse 42. There is only one thing. Everyone say one thing. There's only one thing worth being concerned about, Martha. And Mary has discovered it. And it will not be taken away from her. Guys, I want you to lean in. I want you to listen. I don't want you to miss out on this point until we go to my third and final point. And that is this. There are going to be things in this world, in this life, that are gonna, they're gonna catch your eye. There's gonna be roads that you're gonna wanna go down, situations and circumstances that may seem good at the time, but if Jesus is not in your life, you're missing in and out on the most important thing. He is that one thing. Without him, you are missing out on everything. See, we all have different paths to walk. We all have different stories that God is telling. For some, you grew up in a Christian home. You followed the rule book. It was neat and clean and no caffeine, right? That's your story. Others, not so much. You went down those roads. You were looking for what you weren't looking for. Life was a little bit messier. It was not as linear. And if you're being, on, if you're being honest, you stress tested the grace thing a lot. But the truth is, is God is good in both of their lives. You know, sometimes we see a gal like Mary, Mary Magdalene, who's at, the, at the, the, the open grave, and we ask ourselves the question, she must have had it all together. She must have, she must have never had any challenges. I want to remind you, Mary Magdalene was a demon-possessed woman at one time. It's safe to say she had a past. It's safe to say that she might have had some emotional challenges. But when she came into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it changed her forever. So here are the two things I want you to catch before we go to the last point. That there is seeking that happens when we are looking for Jesus. And we are seeking for a lot of things. And you don't have to all have the perfect story. You don't have to have it all figured out. You can have some doubts. You can have some questions. And I'm going to ask you the question, the same question that Jesus asked Mary. What is it that you're looking for? And my hope would be that you would look for Jesus because if you will look for him, you will be found by him because Jesus knows your name. And he knows your name in the midst of whatever you're going through, your hurt, your habit, your hang-up. When life is messy, it's not making sense, he still knows your name. Here's the question, though. What are you going to do? Number three, if you would write this down. It's the surrender of Easter. It's the surrender it's where we get to the place where we just, we just trust God. We, we get on our knees. We, we raise our hands in surrender and we say, God, help. Look at the scripture here, verse 18. I have seen the Lord. Uh, what, what do we know about that right there? 
What we know is, is, that, is that not only did Jesus know her name, but he began to give her a greater purpose. You know, the identity uh, that, that Mary had before uh, changed in a word. And, and, and Jesus called her by name. And how Mary responded is a way that I think every one of us, whether you're watching online or you're here at the 9 o'clock service, we all have a choice. How will we choose to respond when Jesus calls our name? And the scripture says that Mary got on her knees and she worshiped Jesus. She worshiped him. She surrendered. And then Jesus gave her a mission. And the mission was, I want you to go and tell others. I want you to go and share the good news that Jesus is alive. Everyone say it out loud with me. Jesus is alive. And that's exactly what Mary did. She went and she told the disciples that, that Jesus was alive. Let me share with you in another gospel, Matthew chapter 28, 8 to 9. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. I love that. Afraid yet filled with joy. And ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, uh, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. You know, it might seem a little bit far-fetched, but it seems to me like Jesus is kind of doing some of that like, hey, like, um, I'm just going to show up in a room, right? Kind of a deal, right? And, and I want you to know that seems a little bit far-fetched. But can I also say that the whole thing about resurrecting yourself from the dead is a bit far-fetched as well, Amen. So I'm thinking at that moment, there's going to be multiple times where Jesus is just kind of going to show up. And though he was fully, fully man and he had gone to heaven, he came back. I want to remind you, one of the first things Jesus did when he came back is he appeared to his disciples and said, hey, let's have breakfast. Let's have a breakfast burrito, Bethany, right? Let's do that, right? And that's exactly what he did. And so we see Jesus appears to the disciples he says, greetings, listen to what happens here. They came to him, they clasped his feet, and what did they do, church? They what? They worshiped him. They surrendered to him. And that's exactly what we're being called to do today. We're being called wherever we are, whether we're sold out in our faith, whether we are skeptical in our faith, whether we're stumbling in our faith, we are all called in our own way to surrender our lives to him. And that is the surrender of Easter. You know, John chapter 20, verse 26 and 28 says this, that it was a week later his disciples were in a house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. There he goes doing it again, right? And he says, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side, and what, everyone? Stop what? Doubting and what? Believe. Have you ever heard of a doubting Thomas before? Well, here's where we are. This is where we got the phrase, a doubting Thomas. And it says that Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Not last week I shared with you uh, uh, artwork from, uh, from Rembrandt. This week what I wanted to do is share with you artwork from another painter by the name of um, Caravaggio. And Caravaggio has painted this picture. It's called Thomas. And what you can see is in his own realistic way, you can see that it shows, the artist shows Thomas literally placing his finger inside of the womb in Jesus' side. Scripture will tell us that Jesus will say, blessed are you that you have seen and that you believe, but blessed are others who will not see and what? Believe. You know, for some of you right now, you got a little bit of doubting Thomas in you. If you could just see the, 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 the side, the, the piercing on the side, if you could have just seen the, the spot in Jesus' hands where, where it held him to the cross. But, but what I want you to know is, is that there is, a, there is a sorrow to Easter. There is, a, there, there is a, a surrender of Easter. There is a seeking to Easter. And the question is, is we have to ask ourselves, how will we respond to that? As I prepare to close, I'm going to 
ask the, the band to make their way on up to the stage. What I, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to share with you those action steps on, on our notes. And, and they're simply this, is that we must be willing to surrender. Surrendering your life to Jesus. A lot of times we make it out to be so challenging and so difficult, but it doesn't need to be such. The scriptures tell us in, in, uh, in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so the question that I have for you is simply this. Have you come to a place in your life where you've surrendered your life to him? where you've declared with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. I know that in a room, we've all said Jesus is alive. We've said that as a crowd. But my question for you is, is have you come to a place where you've personally surrendered your life to him? Where you've declared with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? If you haven't, today is that day. Today's the day that I'm going to give you that opportunity to surrender your life to him. The second thing that I want to encourage you to do, it's right there in your notes, is I want you to not only to make him your savior, but your Lord. And to make him your Lord means that you're going to be obedient to his teachings. And by his teachings, the teachings say this, that when you believe the good news about Jesus, then you were baptized, both men and women. And so baptism is one of those things that we do, not because it's convenient, uh, not because it's easy, um, but because it's something that Jesus told us we're to do. It's something that he said, I want you to believe and be baptized. And when we do that, we're, we're representing the life of Jesus, his death, burial, and when we come up out of the water, his resurrection to new life. So if there are those of you that are prepared to get baptized today, um, I want to encourage you at this time to go get changed. But also, uh, if there are others that you have not out of obedience said yes to being baptized, um, you can go and do it right now. Over here to my left are going to be some T-shirts and some shorts, guys and gals. Uh, we've got some towels. And, and I'm saying this is going to be an opportunity on Easter Sunday where you can not only believe, but that you can be baptized. And so I'm going to say any time between now and when it's time to be baptized, I'm going to encourage you. Some of our deacons are going to make their way over there. And we want to get you the size that you need. It's an obedience issue. And I would encourage you to do it. You might be thinking to yourself, but Brent, it is Easter Sunday, and I've got some pictures i got to take afterwards. I want to tell you how beautiful it would be for you to be able to say, you see my hair? You see my makeup, it's all runny, it's a mess. You know why? It's because I was obedient and I gave my life to Jesus and I was baptized. And friends, that would be incredibly good news. Amen, church. And then finally, that you would say, you know what, I want to belong to the family of God. I want to, I, I don't want to be an orphan. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to run. I want to come running to the arms of God. Acts 2 says that the believers were together. They had everything in common. Friends, you don't have to be alone. There's more than just attending a service. You can belong to a family. But for you to do that, you have to surrender your life to him. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say this. If you have never said yes to Jesus, if you've never said, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, he's the son of the living God, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to do something kind of crazy. I'm going to ask you, when I count to three, I'm just going to ask you to say, I believe. Like, not not in the quietness of your heart, but verbally, with your mouth, I'm going to ask you to say, I believe. I just want to tell you that when you do that, it is going to be the best decision of your life. So, I'm going to do it. I'm going to count to three, and if that is you, if you've never said yes to Jesus publicly, with your mouth. And maybe there was some time at at camp when you were in the fifth grade and you don't know, it's kind of fuzzy. Or it's a really long time ago, but you've been stress testing grace and all chasing what you haven't looked for before. And if you find yourself at a crossroads, a pivotal moment in your life where you want to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord, when I count to three, I just want some of you to boldly say, I believe. And trust me, you'll never regret that decision. If that's you, when I count to three, I just want you to say boldly, I believe. One, two, three. Would you stand with me this time? I'm going to pray for you. 
If you've made a decision to believe and out of obedience today, you are giving your life to Christ. If you've not been baptized, I encourage you. It's not gonna save you. You're saved now by the profession of your mouth. But if today's the day of obedience, I encourage you to move to my left and to your right and follow through with this. And we will celebrate this time with you. So Lord God, we now, we give you this final song. We give you our worship. We give you our life. I'm thankful for those who have verbally with their mouth confessed you as Lord. I'm thankful for the fact, God, that there are those who now are going to be obedient to you through baptism. God, thank you that we can come to an empty tomb. You can meet us where we are and we can leave changed, not as strangers, but as sons and daughters, not as orphans, but as children of the living God. We love you, but only because you loved us first. It's the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we pray. And all God's children said what? Amen and amen. So Heinrich, Heinrich come, over, come on over here real quick. Oh, I've got a, I gotta get my, my shirt here real quick. So, uh, all right, while I do that. Yeah, yeah, you guys can have a quick seat and then we'll, we'll get you out of here. 
So I'm going to have you turn here, and I'm going to have you uh, say hello to all your friends. All right. What's your name? Henry. This is Henry. And, uh, and my, my question is, is this. Is it your desire to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Yes, it is. All right. If you would um, repeat after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. All right. So in front of your faith family, your family family, um, and most importantly in front of Jesus, it's an honor now to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. so glad that you came here today. Um, if I haven't met you before, I'm Pastor Bruce. I'm one of the pastors on, on staff here and glad to, glad to serve you. Um, if you're new with us and you filled out that, uh, that little sheet on the bottom of your, of your program, uh, please drop it off in the box here in the front foyer there. And we've got a little gift to uh, send with you. And we just want to say thank you for being here and hope you come again very, very soon. Um, so let's um, read our benediction together. We have a new benediction today, and we're going to read this together. And it says from Hebrews 13, 20 through 21, Now may God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And if you're one of those people that maybe said for the first time, I believe this morning, or if you have a hurt or a hang up or something that you just like to have someone pray with you about, uh, we have people from our prayer team that are going to be here in the front on both sides. And if you feel comfortable, come on down. And we'd be glad to, to share some time of prayer with you. God bless you. Have a great, great, great Resurrection Sunday. <laughs>